Jess, I'm ready whenever you are. Wonderful. All righty. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's Lunch and Learn, Understanding the Wildlife and Marine Impacts of Offshore Wind. Offshore wind energy is rapidly becoming a near-term climate solution throughout the Northeast. However, this has generated some concerns about how wind energy will affect wildlife and the marine ecosystem. Dr. Damian Brady, Agatha B. Darling Professor of Oceanography at the University of Maine at Orno is here to tell us about how scientists at the University of Maine are and will be researching the impacts of offshore wind on wildlife and the marine ecosystem. Dr. Brady, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, my name is Francesca Gundrum, but everyone knows me as Chess, and I'm a communications manager at Maine Conservation Voters and Maine Conservation Alliance. Our organizations represent more than 8,500 members and supporters dedicated to protecting Maine's environment and our democracy. MCA does that through education, collaboration, and advocacy, and MCV by influencing public policy, holding politicians accountable, and winning elections. A few technical notes for today's event. Uh, we'll hear from our speaker and tackle Q and A, uh, tackle questions in the Q and A session at the end of our program. But you don't have to wait. If you've got some burning questions, you can send them to me through the chat as they occur to you, and I'll keep track of them and get to as many as possible during the Q&A session. Please message Will Sedlak if any technical difficulties arise. This event is being recorded, and the video will be posted on our website later this afternoon, along with recordings of all of our previous Lunch and Learns. Thank you all again for joining us today. And Dr. Brady, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Thank you, Ches. Uh, let me just share my screen. So thank you very much everyone for, uh, for coming today. It's a, it's a real honor to be able to address uh, the main conservation voters on this really, really important topic. Uh, that seems to be kind of evolving by the day. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'll, I'll talk about um, primarily two, uh, two experiences and two projects that I've been involved with. Um, the, the figure that you're seeing right now, for instance, is the, uh, is, the, is the turbine that would go off of Monhegan as part of the New England Aquaventus One project. So I'll be talking a little bit about that, a little bit about our experiences deploying an offshore wind turbine um, off of Castine as well. Uh, because there's so many projects happening in the Northeast, I just wanted to kind of summarize and bring everyone up to speed. And, and I think the idea of this is Maine has been, you know, walk before you run, run, uh, and then jog before you run. So uh, the, the first grid connected floating offshore wind turbine in the US was deployed from 2013 to 2014. That was in Castine, Maine. So I'm going to be using that as a kind of case study for some of the technologies that we used to uh, monitor that project. And that's and, and this is what that project looked like. So just uh, this is the, uh, the idea of um, uh, crawling before you walk. I'll, I'll get my metaphor straight pretty soon. And so this is the 1 8 scale turbine. So you can see this is a, a fairly large sailboat sailing next to it, but the sailboat is larger than the, than the turbine. This 1 8 scale turbine was a demonstration of the technology and some of the wind wave conditions that it experienced in Penobscot Bay were equivalent to the 50, 100 year return storms that, uh, that the platform would face inside the Gulf of Maine. And so it was a proof of concept that the actual platform that the turbine would be floating on uh, would work. So that was an 18 month deployment. And I'll be talking about how we monitor that project a little bit. So then the next scale here is an actual commercial scale turbine. So not one eight scale, but a, a turbine that would generate a significant amount of electricity. In this case, that's around 11.4 megawatts to, to be uh, deployed off of Monhegan Island in the, next, uh, in the next couple of years. And I've been working on that project as the environmental monitoring coordinator uh, for the past 11 years. And just to put that in perspective, uh, that would be 200 meters from the water line up to the, uh, the top of the turbine. The, it's 125 meters from the water line up to the nacelle. 
um, so or 412 feet. So this is a, this is a significant jump in the scale of the turbine, but obviously that's necessary to generate um, electricity on a commercial scale. And then I will be talking about this far less, but there's the the main research array. Um, and that's uh, way on the horizon. That would be 10 to 12 turbines, each about 14 megawatts uh, for a location that's uh, um, uh, it's about 20 to 40 miles due east of Portland. And you can go online at the, um, uh, at the governor's energy office to see a lot more about the final location for that. But I won't be talking about it, but I, I, I bring that up because that's the real, um, the next step past this Monhegan project. Here's an example of what that might look like out on the ocean to scale. Uh, this is about 12 turbines, three sets of four. I realize the top uh, right turbines may be difficult to see, but this just gives you a sense that each of these turbines would be about a mile apart. And they're all floating on using the same technology that was developed at the 1 8 scale, uh, just scaled up to 14 megawatts. Uh, I asked a friend of mine who uh, who works at uh, CMP to to help me understand why offshore wind energy is going to be so important in the future, especially in the New England. Uh, he forwarded me this Brattle Group report. I really like it because it it highlights to me the reason that um, offshore wind is going to be uh, is such a focus for the Northeast of the United States and New England in general is that if we electrify our heating systems in a place like Maine, we are going to find that our peak demand is going to be in January's, November's, and December's. And um, uh, that's going to be double the peak demand that we sometimes will get in the summer if we link heating and we completely electrify our infrastructure. So I highlight that because wind, as opposed to solar, will be at least part of the solution to understand and to address peak load in the, in the winter in particular. And so after they do the models, I, I highlight again that you know you can't you're not going to be able to get 43 gigawatts on on land uh, or onshore wind. So that that number of gigawatts that it requires to reach electrification for winter heating, for instance, is going to require at least some part of your mix to be offshore wind. So the question for me as an oceanographer and a marine scientist at the University of Maine, and I'm out of the Darling Marine Center is, how are we gonna put this in the water and have the least amount of impact to other existing uses and existing habitats? How does this get done? I, I, I often you know, wanna, wanna be able to tell people that are really interested in this and interested in the development of offshore wind that there's a tremendous amount of permits and approvals required to do this project. And this Monhegan project is obviously um, one turbine, uh, but in order to do that, uh, we are constantly um, in contact with agencies and talking about what the proper way to monitor and understand these projects will be. Uh, Department of Environmental Protection for the General Permit of Offshore Wind, Maine Submerged Lands Program, uh, if needed for installation, the Maine Department of Transportation for the utility location for the cable to shore, US Army Corps of Engineers for Rivers and Harbor, Clean Water Act, Federal Aviation for the lighting systems that are on these turbines, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, NIMFS, US Fish and Wildlife for the Endangered Species Act consultation, Fish and Wildlife Coordination Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act, Magazine Stevens Fisheries Act, uh, as well as the, the core um, consultation with the main Department of Marine Resources um, uh, for some of those aspects that uh, may impinge upon existing marine resources in the Gulf of Maine. And there's a, obviously also a Historic Preservation Commission that gets involved with the aesthetics as well as potential impacts to marine archaeology. Uh, so it's a tremendous amount of, um, I don't want to call them hoops, because I think all of these are really, really important for minimizing the impacts of these projects. So why is it so complex and why does it involve so many different agencies? So when you move to floating offshore wind, what you ha end up dealing with when you're trying to invest in trying to figure out what you should monitor is that you have three fairly complex ecosystems. You have the aerial ecosystem where your birds, bats, and insects are. You have your pelagic or open water ecosystem. So you know, pelagic being a word here, just meaning the open water aspects of potential impact. And then you have what we call demersal or benthic, so impacts to the bottom. Uh, and in this case, for floating offshore winds, those impacts to the bottom are primarily twofold, the mooring systems that hold these in place, because they're not just floating, uh, as well as the cable to shore. 
What's kind of cool is that there are about 5,500 turbines in Europe, and there's a lot to be learned in Europe, but there are very, very few floating turbines. But um, High Wind Scotland is the world's first floating offshore wind farm. Uh, the company Equinor um, uh, deployed this. It's using a spar design, and by spar design, it just means that the, the ballast uh, that holds it up is just a long piece that goes deep, pretty deep into the water. This is how the cables are connected. This is how they are moored. So these individual lines are looking at the Equinor project from the surface. And uh, so you'll see that each of them have three moorings. This is gonna be pretty similar to the Monhegan project, um, but th there'll be cables that connect the, uh, the individual turbines uh, to each other. And then finally a cable to shore. And the reason I think it's, it's cool is we can finally see what happens on these, flo on these um, floating wind farms. Just to give you a sense of how this wind farm, the High Wind Scotland's mooring and cable structure, it's got a spar design and then it has a bridal uh, triplet upper mooring line and then a heavy chain section and then a touchdown point. So this is one of the um, places that we're interested in in our project is what happens at this touchdown point in terms of um, disturbance, uh, disturbance to the bottom. Uh, and then these are what the cable infrastructure looks like. There's a lazy S, some floating and then the cables buried between the turbines. So the recently Highwind Scotland released a report demonstrating what happens to the, um, uh, to the mooring infrastructure. And because Scotland is pretty similar to Maine in many ways, you'll notice that some of the species that recruit to the substructure that grow on the substructure. So this is 100% coverage at about three meters deep of middleist mussels and laminaria um, kelp. Uh, so what you're looking at here is probably what, uh, what we're going to see a lot of on the substructure. Of course, they have a steel substructure. Our substructure will be concrete. So it'll be interesting to see what recruits to it. Um, again, you can see on the mooring uh, tunicates, uh, um, a lot more um, invertebrates recruiting to the structure. So we expect something fairly similar to happen. This is kind of uh, cool. This is the buoyancy module on the cable. So that's that little thing that that floats the cable. Um, if I go back to this, uh, this structure right here um, that gives it this lazy S, so it gives it a little bit of slack so that as the turbine moves around, it doesn't pull on the cable. That was completely covered, uh, the buoyancy module 67. It's 100% faunal coverage. You can see a lot of anemones, sea fans, um, uh, other species that recruit to this. So it brings up a really interesting question to me, which is, <clears throat> what is the future of these projects going to look like when um, organisms are recruiting to it and it's changing the structure of the water column? So what I wanted to show is this video from some colleagues that are in Quebec. They're looking at tidal power generation. What you're looking at in this video now is the wake that's generated from the tidal um, uh, turbine. And so on top of this, we can use something called particle image velocimetry to look at the speed of the water from a drone. So you're looking at footage from a drone and that footage is showing you the water speed around there. But I just wanna point out the red right there is upwelling. So these are areas where the water is coming to the surface. After that, they can track individual turns. So we're clearly seeing one turn flying around um, the ecosystem. And I'm going to kind of move forward. So you see the turn flying over the wake. Um, sometimes the turns dive into the water. That's the yellow part of, uh, of their line. Um, that's foraging. The, um, the blue is transiting between foraging. And then finally, if you see towards the end of it, they put on the, uh, they put on the tracks they put the turn tracks over the upwelling. The only reason I wanted to, to, um, to highlight that is if I pause this right here, you'll, what we'll notice is the active foraging where it's yellow is often the areas of wake that are, that essentially mean the water is coming to the surface, what we call upwelling. And so that water coming to the surface is bringing nutrients. Those nutrients feed phytoplankton, those phytoplankton feed zooplankton. And you'll notice that oftentimes the foraging of the turns follow the wake um, where uh, water and therefore prey is coming to the surface. Where we're really interested in going with these research level projects on offshore wind is understanding the potential interactions between below water ecosystems and above water ecosystems. And these are, this I just thought was maybe one of the coolest tools that I've seen at, at trying to understand these, uh, these wake zones 
um, uh, that will develop in the lee of some of these farms as, a, as one potential interaction. The other big potential interaction is we bring in a lot of Michaelis and uh, Michaelis as well as uh, Laminaria and we look at interactions between what grows on the turbines and what might come to forage on that. So uh, there commonly, uh, anything you put out in the water, if you're familiar with, you know, even putting your boat out in the water, oftentimes that creates a sh um, shade or shadow effect. We call that a fisheries aggregation device. Um, it's fairly common that the moment you put something that floats out in the water, you're going to have fish gather underneath it. Part of it is, de you know, deposition of organic matter. Uh, part of it is um, the actual shade itself. Some of it is just attracting forage fish and then larger fish come to forage there. Um, so that is potentially also another interesting um, effect of offshore wind is that you will have species probably gather underneath it uh, because there's um, potential forage falling off of it and for other reasons. And so some of the technology that's out there is really interesting that can use um, turn acoustic signals into digital images. This is often called DIDSIN. Um, there are other acoustic technologies like split beam that will tell you how many fish are there. So you send an acoustic beam out there, it tells you how many targets, but it doesn't tell you whether the targets are moving. And then we have technology called split beam that can tell you the direction of, of the fish are moving. So you get more information on behavior. And then eventually you can have multi-beam systems sending multiple beams of acoustic energy out and looking at targets coming back tracking those targets and you can actually track the species underneath there. So it's another effect that we're really interested in is this idea of that these turbines will act as fisheries aggregation devices. So fishing is a really, really tricky issue when it comes to offshore wind and one that these research scale projects like the one single turbine off of Monhegan um, will hopefully help us start to address. So what I've shown you is the, the uh, overview. So this is the view of the turbine. This is the central part where the turbine would be. This is where the platform, those, the tripod of the platform would come out. These blue lines are the mooring lines. And so our question on the fishery side is, are all these triangles that are in between the mooring structures very fishable, in particular for fixed gear, so like the American lobster fishery? Um, what are the chances of fishing under buried moored lines? And just to give you a sense, each of these anchor points here are buried 30 to 40 feet underneath the sediment. So the anchors aren't sitting on the surface per se. So one of, another question is whether fishing would be uh, um, allowed above these mooring structures. Another piece of really important research we need to work on is gear entanglement. So whereas marine mammals won't get entangled on these systems in the, on the offshore systems because these chains and or synthetic mooring lines are so large, uh, if people get lobster gear trapped in them, will that in turn uh, uh, present an entanglement issue? So that, um, that requires having notification of gear entanglement as part of the research. There's lots of other really important fisheries coexistence research questions, but these are a few that we're really interested in as we move forward with the Monhegan project. And obviously compensation for lost gear, setting up those kinds of programs is gonna be really important. So remote sensing of offshore wind development is gonna be required. It's not like onshore wind where you can simply walk out to a site. And because of that, we're gonna need pretty robust platforms to put gear on uh, to, to measure things like that echo sounder, which is the, the instrument that's sending acoustic waves out into the water and then taking that information back. Radar for birds, so sending out radar, um, using radar to um, search for uh, bird targets, target rates cameras, passive acoustic detectors that listen for things like songbirds and bats, as well as receivers that listen for tagged species. We're tagging more and more fish and birds all the time. We want to make sure that we're, we're listening for them all the time. Here's an example of the radar imagery. So this is from a radar that we deployed off the southern tip of Monhegan. Each of those red dots that you're seeing above there is a potential target moving through the area. We can add up those potential targets. So this just gives you a sense of where the Monhegan uh, um, radar was deployed. It was pointing out to the test site, which is kind of where my, uh, my pointer is. And the vertical, vertically oriented radar can pick up flight height and the horizontal picks up a, a much bigger swath at, at um, particular flight heights. <laughs> 
Some of the results of this, uh, and just to, to show you, each of these are the target rates. So this is the number of birds or the proportion of birds at a particular altitude. So from zero to 2000 meters or 6,000 feet, more than uh, 6,000 feet into the air. And you can see that birds are you know, moving through here. But what I wanted to point out is that there's about 291,000 or 157,000 in early and late fall and maybe 37,000 in winter. So it, it just highlights for us that um, fall and fall migration is an important time to focus on uh, and focus on those um, target rates that are coming in. One way to do that is to tag birds during these particular seasons. There's a wildlife tracking system called MODIS, and it's a series of antennas all up and down um, Canada and the United States and, and globally uh, that are essentially towers that as, as many birds as we tag, we can get a sense of where they're moving through. And so the Monhegan project, for instance, would have a MODIS tower attached to it so that we know the birds moving through specifically. Similar for bats, um, you know, again, if, if bats are tagged, you can det detect them through MODIS, but for the most part, we use what are called paired acoustic detector equipment. So this is uh, work that we did out at Castine. So this is Dice Head Lighthouse, if you're not familiar with it. We know that bats use offshore environments. Um, uh, and uh, so characterizing that's gonna be really important. These paired acoustic deployments can tell us uh, um, the frequency of bats. In our case, uh, big brown bat and silver haired bat were the two primary um, species that we saw in this particular survey. And we can actually turn that into the number of times we heard a, a, a bat uh, by the hour of the day. And this became really important because you can, there are various mitigation measures that one can do clearly about one to two hours after sunset and then about an hour or two uh, before sunrise are big um, periods of activities for bats. So if you want to focus in your monitoring on a particular time location and get more specifics, this is the kind of information that lets you focus in on where you should be looking in the future. And so clearly those are the foraging periods for bats um, uh, where there's a little bit of light, um, but not too much light. So we actually set up when I have a couple of movies here, which I think could be um, really interesting, but we set up a web webcam um, at uh, essentially a neighbor of the casting um, turbines house and that webcam faced out uh, to the turbine. And so then I had uh, we had interns that were essentially clicked through the following day, clicked through all the images uh, about at once a minute. And every time we saw a bird, we then captured the video of the bird um, to see how they were interacting um, with the turbine. So I just wanted to show maybe a couple of videos from the, uh, from that. We also had these downward facing cameras too. I think at the time it was to see if anyone was going to come up and. Uh, uh, onto the turbine, for instance, and be able to, to view them. But that, that's going to come up in a second. So by the way, this is the birds by hour of the day. Clearly, the bird activity was very, very high in terms of the number of birds we saw through the camera um, at uh, around sunrise. Um, maybe no surprise. Uh, and then that tails off uh, for the rest of the day. This is what we saw, and then again, this is the number of birds we were counting uh, via the camera right at the site. And so again, not a big surprise, but September, again, that fall migration period in, in Castine was clearly the uh, essentially a time period of, of much um, bigger bird activity. Again, this is very near shore, it's in Penobscot Bay, it's not reflective of a true offshore uh, test site. So there's probably more summer activity than we would expect in some of those other places like that are further offshore. One thing that we noticed, by the way, is that when this, once the turbine went out, there was a tremendous amount of activity out there in terms of boats passing the turbine. Um, so this just gives you a sense of uh, the number of boats we observed in the camera. So we're talking 50 to 150 boats per day going by the turbine. The first year we put it out was clearly uh, generated a lot of interest. And so it was probably roughly double the amount that we would see in the second year. Uh, these dots, by the way, are July 4th. So we could, we could tell that there was a lot of recreation out on the water. Um, and it generally correlated pretty well with bird activity too. There's a lot of people out there. There's a lot of um, uh, birds that follow those boats. So just to give you a sense of when we were looking at 
uh, bird activity, we tried to capture a video of every time a bird was even near the turbine. So this is a, um, a bird flying in front of the turbine, so significantly in front of the turbine. I'm hoping that over Zoom and, and over a shared screen, it, it's kind of uh, visible as the bird moves from the left part of your screen to the right part of your screen. So that's a pretty innocuous interaction. Again, I'm just going to highlight with my cursor, the uh, this is the camera that you saw before facing down at the turbine. So here's a different interaction. What you're going to see is a cormorant, double-breasted cormorant. It's going to move from the left side of your screen, and then it's going to actually perch on the camera that we put up there uh, to try to um, look for wildlife and, and uh, other animals out there. So I'll play that again because the, the cormorant can be hard to see. Um, but you can see that it flies from low. Cormorants are usually flying low to the water and moving up rather than a bird that will fly up and then come down. I will say that the US Fish and Wildlife uh, uh, said that we were one of the only projects ever to actually share lots of video with them um, uh, you know, in terms of birds interacting with the, with the turbine. And you can see it perch on the, on the camera. And we're pretty sure this is the same one because pretty much day after day, the same cormorant was visiting. This time it's gonna be moving from left to right and perching in that same area. And if I show that one more time, this is the cormorant moving from left to right up to the turbine. Again, species like alcids and other bird species that fly generally fly low to the water and move up to the turbine will have a different risk profile than gulls that generally fly higher and go down. So I, I wanted to, if I could, uh, take that time to kind of show you actual videos of the turbine. The, the last thing I wanted to bring up was this idea of having a robust monitoring in this offshore environment. And it basically starts with a, with a buoy that is capable of putting all the, the, uh, the um, sensing technologies that I mentioned before. And so this is one that we've been experimenting with quite a bit. It's called Deep Sea LiDAR. It's an offshore wind resource assessment buoy. It's the first floating LiDAR buoy. If you're not familiar with LiDAR, in this case, it sends a, a laser or a beam up through the middle of it. And then as particles and other things pass over the beam, you can use that to track the speed of the air. So it will actually track the speed at rotor hub height, which is about, as you saw before, 125 meters off the waterline. Um, but it can also, we can also deploy um, listening devices on that turbine for songbirds. The one thing we cannot do on it so far is radar. Uh, radar requires a much more stable platform. Um, and so people have been developing what are called monster buoys, which is kind of a funny term, but those monster buoys are so large that, um, that they essentially represent a stable platform. And they tend to be a little bit cheaper than buying a full-time barge um, to put out at the site. Just to give you a sense of deep sea LIDAR and you know, our hope is to be deploying this kind of technology in anywhere where there's gonna be um, a new uh, wind farm. You can see that it measures the wind speed at, from 40 to 200 meters uh, at hub height, wind, waves, currents, acoustics, um, birds, bats, and fish. And acoustics uh, and birds, bats, and fish are mostly these are listening devices. That can also include what are called passive acoustic monitors. They listen for whale songs. Uh, I didn't get a chance to talk too much about whales today, but very, very happy to answer questions about, uh, about that piece of the technology. There is some significant benefits to floating technology when it comes to interactions with marine mammals because you don't pile drive or construct it out at site. You construct it on shore and you actually tow it out to the site. Um, but there are other um, interactions that are potentially important for us to, to monitor. So I tried to keep, uh, I tried to keep uh, uh, us down uh, in terms of the amount of time that I was spending on, on discussing this because generally when I discuss this material, there are so many questions that it's just much more fruitful to answer those questions as directly as I can um, uh, than, to, than to go into every aspect. Um, so uh, hopefully uh, I've brought, up, brought you up to speed with some of the technologies that we're considering for monitoring offshore wind development. Absolutely. I think I, I speak for everyone when I say yes. <laughs> That's a great primer. Dr. Brady, thank you so much. This was such a comprehensive series of explanations about the impacts, um, positive included, which was um, nice to hear that offshore wind could have on Maine's marine ecosystems and wildlife. So thank you. Uh, before we get into questions, 
I just wanted to remind everyone uh, that you'll get a follow-up email from me later today, and I will include links to learn more about offshore wind in Maine overall, and also the development of the offshore wind roadmap and how you can get involved. Okay, but with that, lots of questions. So we're gonna dive right in. First off, uh, at the start of your talk today, you mentioned a really long list of entities and federal legislation and everything that's involved in making sure that these projects are done right. Um, do you think this list that you shared with us today is exhaustive or are there other, other groups that we should be including in these conversations? So um, it's not totally exhaustive. So my list was paired by where the permits have to come through. So even though that it, it may say an organization is helping with a particular permit or to address a particular act like the Marine Mammal Protection Act or the essential fish habitat clauses in Megs and Stevens, it's not comprehensive insofar as then you have to then consult with any particular uh, um, impacted community. So whether that's the fishing community, tribal communities. Um, so the pro these projects then have to interface with those organizations. There is a NEPA public scoping process. So if you're not familiar with that, uh, that's a period of time where lots of organizations, I'm sure MCV, National uh, Audubon, uh, the TNC, as well as individuals, fishing communities, fishing organizations can put in their essentially um, concerns. Those concerns that end up having to be addressed in the environmental assessment, they end up being addressed by the Fish and Wildlife Monitoring Plan. So that process of getting as much input from as many different stakeholders or partners as possible is really, really important up front. And it, gen, it genuinely does, you know, essentially those get filtered in through the, through the developer or through uh, the university, for instance, when we were developing our Castine project and they essentially become the things that we have to monitor in the future. Excellent, thank you. Um, next up, uh, and you mentioned this a little bit in talking about what's happening in the UK and fish aggregation underneath boats and how mussels are, are um, staying on the equipment. So what, are there any other, um, any other sorts of changes that we're seeing in terms of improvements beyond aggregation, but in population dynamics, are we seeing spawning behavior change? Um, or what do you expect to see, especially with flo uh, floating offshore wind in particular? Yeah, so I think the key will be what ends up recruiting to these structures. So is it middleus and is it going to be laminaria? There are also, you know, I know for I deploy buoys all over the state. Uh, you know, they're going to get filled up with things that are less nutritious, so to speak, to other pieces of the marine ecosystem like tunicates. Um, so depends on what ends up recruiting to these types of places. Um, and at a one turbine scale, we probably won't see big changes in circulation. So, um, and even at a 10 to 12 turbine scale, you know, when we think of uh, vin the vineyard project and um, projects that are more closer to hundred turbines, there's obviously a significant amount of energy being taken out of, you know, out of the water or out of the air, right? Which will affect dynamics in the water. So I think at the scale that the Gulf of Maine is looking at in the immediate future, I'd say the next 10 years, there's nothing that will cause, let's say, circulation changes or big oceanographic changes. I think it's really going to be about what recruits to these turbines and then what will eat that um, uh, over time. So, and, and then potentially, I guess, one of the big questions becomes, if it becomes a fishery aggregation device and you get Atlantic herring who like to hang out underneath the, the shade of, uh, of the Monhegan turbine, will that attract, attract things like tuna? which I know is a, a, a burgeoning fishery too within the Gulf of Maine. Amazing, thanks for, for adding on to that a little bit for us. Uh, a big overarching question, what has surprised you for better or for worse in your work so far on this topic? Um, I, sh I should say that I think the thing that, um, I think the most important thing moving into the future is uh, figuring out how to prioritize. I, the, the general way I say this is, if you gave me $100 to monitor this, should I spend $70 on birds and bats and $30 below the water? Uh, is it 
Um, so what has maybe surprised me is that it's hard to prioritize what to invest in, um, in terms of our monitoring. I thought it would be more clear, um, but because it's a holistic problem and it's integrative in that there are things that are happening below the water that could affect things above the water and I potentially vice versa, right? If there's a lot of predation there, there may be species that don't you know, wanna be there. Um, I think that's really what has surprised me most is that this is an integrated problem and it requires integrated solutions to understand well because it's yeah. an ecosystem. Yeah. Wonderful. Yep. Right there with you. Um, we have a few questions about ocean noise and noise pollution in the ocean. And we know, especially in recent years, this has really been something that's been in the news and what people are talking about and how that affects in particular marine mammals. So maybe this is your opportunity to talk a little bit more about what impacts we can expect to see on, on cetaceans or whales and dolphins and more, um, and then in particular with ocean noise. Yeah, so that's a very good question. You know, I'd mentioned that you're not going to have pile driving um, and or um, impacts directly to the bottom that you will have with a monopile fixed um, uh, installation of offshore wind. So that's good. Um, we still, I think, need to understand the propagation of noise from the turbine through the water, but propagation from, uh, from the air 125 meters up down through the water uh, is probably not very high. Um, we avoid vi um, some of the vibration concerns for monopile fix, right, because it's propagating vibration from the turbine down through the tower. Um, at some, some rate. So that is dissipated because it goes into the platform. The platform is concrete. Um, so the noise per se, you know, that we're interested in trying to minimize and understand our maintenance. So you've got to go out to this with crew transport vehicles. Um, again, you know, we have uh, quite a number of lobster boats along the coast. So this is not a, a new type of, uh, of noise that, that's coming into the system like this, but we will be deploying some underwater microphones to try to understand noise propagating from the turbine down into the water and then potentially noise from you know, water and other things hitting up against the platform, for instance, and, and going underneath the water. Um, and then as far as cetaceans go, um, obviously I think, there, the, so just to give you a sense, if we go with a steel catenary anchor design, each chain in the steel catenary design is something like three feet. Um, you know, you wouldn't be able to lift it. And so the actual mooring structures are almost like fixed structures in the water. It's only under conditions of, of gale or 100 year returns that the turbine's even gonna move a lot and the moorings are going to move a lot uh, un under those conditions. And so the, and then the alternative, which are synthetic moorings. So this is rope, essentially. Um, this would be really, really, really big rope, but it would be semi-taut. So there's no uh, risk of looping or entanglement from that standpoint. Um, so for us, you know, some of the work that we're doing is more about something we call secondary entanglement um, for cetaceans, which is someone puts their gear near the mooring system, it gets wrapped in there, and then that, that gear is, it, uh, you know, poses, an, poses an issue. And then I guess the last thing I'll say is we will have a passive acoustic monitor. So it's been a passive acoustic monitor. So this is something that listens for whale calls. Um, we couple that with monthly visual observations just because you, you, I guess as Yogi Berra said, you learn, you can see a lot just by looking. Um, so we'll have people out there. There are species like humpback whale, for instance, that change their song annually. And so passive acoustic monitors are less effective because humpback whales are constantly changing their, their song. Um, so that's why coupling that with some visual observations is really important. That's great to hear. And just a quick follow up on that. When you say we'll have people out there, do you mean boat surveys or will people actually be on the floating turbines or near them? Or what does that look like? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I think for, for, and I, you know, hate to comment on operations and maintenance because it's not my, it's not my bag, but, uh, but for operations and maintenance, I, I can see that people will be out there. I don't think, th and I should say they're not out there long-term. They're out there to work on it and then come back. There's no living quarters or anything like that. It's certainly large enough <laughs> uh, to have living quarters out there. Our visual observations will all be boat-based around the turbine. Excellent. Um, 
a question about the mooring system, and you spoke to this a little bit in the, your answer just now, um, but what sort of effects can we see to the seabed, the seabed, the, the um, benthic environment just by actually putting those, those few moorings there for each, for each turbine? Yeah, and so I'll get, just give you the um, example mooring structure. This is not what they're doing out of Monhegan, but this is you know in the, the mix of things that they're interested in looking at, which would be a fairly large drag anchor. Um, and uh, so that drag anchor essentially um, would, it looks like a large wedge. It gets uh, um, put down on the, the bottom and then there's um, two tugboats essentially that drag it into place. And that's how they get it 30 to 40 meters below the surface that's connected to either way, it's going to be connected to some length of chain, then probably to that synthetic rope where it's semi taut up to the structure and then back to some chain until it uh, makes contact with the with the platform. Um, it, under that semi taut structure, there's not a lot of up and down or ground chain sweep um, in that scenario. If you use a steel catenary chain, so that's just chain the way you would normally think of chain, except each link is three feet and impossible to lift by yourself, uh, that would essentially fall almost straight down to the to the bottom in one of those figures that I showed. Then it would lay on the bottom uh, with a long with a fairly long scope and be mo mostly uh, under uh, under the sediment at that point, right? Because it's connecting to an anchor that's thirty to forty meters underneath the the sediment. And then um, there will be if it if you use a steel catenary, there will be a touchdown point, which is where the ang where the chain actually meets the bottom. And that's possible through tide and through really large storms. If the floating platform is moving, that there could be some movement of that mooring chain along the bottom. Um, most of that will be on you know soft sediment. Um, and so there, there is a, a school of thought that says this, you know, this, there's potentially a provision of hard bottom habitat um, from the from that kind of situation from the semi taut mooring. It'll the the advantage of semi taut mooring, by the way, is the scope is a lot smaller. So that circle that I was showing you above the turbines would be a lot smaller. The anchors can be a lot closer. Um, so the overall footprint is is quite a bit lower with the synthetic mooring. Um, but it, it's also you know, a semi-taut system. Excellent. And follow up on the footprint too, is the footprint of offshore, or floating offshore wind versus, um, my, the word is escaping me, but the other kind <laughs> the, uh, that's actually anchored to the bottom. Um, what's the footprint like, the, the difference there? Uh, do you mean, sorry, uh, like a monopile fixed turbine versus fixed. a floating turbine. Yeah. I'm looking okay. for the word fixed. Thank you. Fixed yeah. Model. Yeah. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, so the, for a monopile fixed turbine, so the, the turbines that you might go to see if you hop on a boat and go out to Block Island, for instance, uh, those really, the, the, the footprint per se is generally just the, um, the turbine tower. So however, wide the diameter of the turbine tower is it's it's a little bit wider down on the bottom but that's that's pretty much kind of the footprint of the of that turbine um, whereas the footprint of floating uh, it's never touching the bottom it overall footprint is probably similar in terms of you know adding up the tower stuff because you you don't actually hit the bottom with it um, and most of it is is buried like the anchor and um, and some of the mooring so uh, I, I haven't calculated the actual footprint, which I think in this case would be the the exposed um, chain uh, versus the versus the monopile. But it's a good question. Thanks, um, and thanks for finding the words for me <laughs> this Friday. Um, kind of a larger question: How has technology, in, at least in monitoring for, for impacts to marine ecosystems and wildlife, how much have you seen this change? in your field um, since you started to now? So that's a really good, so let me just rewind. When we were first thinking about Monhegan and I first started interacting with folks at UMaine about Monhegan, you know, we were talking about a three megawatt turbine and now the research array potentially, you know, is uh, 14 megawatts, right? So the, the technology on the wind side has just Really gone up uh, quite a bit on the same on the same turbine platform. Essentially, small minor changes to the platform, but the amount of power you can generate per turbine has really gone up quite a bit. And then, correspondingly, the monitoring technology, while it has improved a lot 
Uh, so I, I didn't get a chance to mention it today and I, I could put it in there is there's now thermal tracking cameras for bats, right? That are fairly good. Um, there's machine learning image technology and image processing that can try to pick out bird targets as they move towards the turbine. But there's a real difference between uh, between research ready and and monitoring ready. So monitoring ready carries a permitting burden that the uh, essentially the, the the developer has to know that that technology really really works. Right? There's no bugs in it. Whereas the research, you can be on the bleeding edge of something, um, but it's not ready for prime time yet. So a lot of the technology that's really interesting like motion capture, like thermal um, imagery and thermal 3D tracking of, of bats. It's really, while it's it's come leaps and bounds, it's not ready for full-time deployment on commercial scale projects yet. Uh, so what I've been really interested in is um, how much of this technology is going to move into that phase, which is it's ready for prime time, it's ready for, for permitting, it's ready for fish and wildlife monitoring plans. So, um, and I should say that the offshore environment, right, is one of the most difficult environments on earth to put this kind of technology out at. So it not only does it have to be fairly consistent, which is to say when it sees something, it's, there's really something there, uh, but it also has to be very robust, right, and take a lot of salt water, um, uh, which is, you know, frankly, very, very difficult for this technology that's mostly been developed for onshore um, uh, wind platforms. Wonderful. Thanks for, for diving in a little bit and thinking about how things have changed and where we're headed. Um, another question here, are there, and you spoke to this a little bit, but are there opportunities for your colleagues and for others to learn more about this really interesting and hard to get to environment um, in their own studies? Do you have anyone that's excited that these are going out and that they can, they can work on their own sorts of things too? Yeah, I, you know, so I'll just give you one really good example. Uh, but the University of Maine has a project called Maine eDNA or environmental DNA. If you're not familiar with that, you take a, a bottle of water and you sequence the DNA in it. And metazoans, you know, multicellular uh, organisms like us and like sturgeon and like shark and like whales, they shed DNA into the water. So you can actually sequence the water and say, yeah, there was a whale here. Yeah, there was a sturgeon here. Um, so that's one of the technologies that we're already going to try to get some water samples out of Monhegan and say, here's what the community of organisms, you know, here's a snapshot of the community of organisms out there. They call that meta barcoding. And then once we put the turbines in, how does that uh, community or how, how does that drop of water that you sequence change or liter of water that you sequence change? So environmental DNA is definitely one of these technologies that I see getting more and more, as I said before, robust, right? It's starting to get more and more reliable to the point where I could see it used in projects like this. And, um, I, you know, I fully expect, right, that organisms that needed hard bottom or wanted to recruit to a structure that was vertical and up in the water column will, you know, hopefully pop up in the, in the environmental DNA after this goes out in the water. But if that works, then there are actually technologies developed now that will sequence water in a buoy offshore sequence it in the buoy and then send you the information in real time. So we're maybe 20 years away from an idea of it sucks in water and then tells you what species that are potentially out there in the water and, and beams that back in real time. I think we're, uh, we're moving towards a technology that, that could work like that. That's awesome. So many opportunities for collaboration in the future beyond this topic. That's great. Um, lots of questions about birds and bats, of course, and you spent a good deal of time um, showing us some awesome videos and um, talking about how we're at least tracking them and when is really important to be aware of where they're going to be and um, how that'll how that'll influence where we put these these projects. So what what are those conversations like in, okay, we know where the birds are going to be, we know where the bats are going to be. How is that impacting um, sighting? And is there anything we can do to technology to uh, mitigate impacts to them? Well, I, I don't know how many uh, folks were um, tuned in to the state of Maine's process of looking for a research um, array site. Uh, I think it's about um, 
16 square uh, square miles or so of space for uh, for that 10 to 12 turbine project. But one of the things that was really, really interesting to me as that started to unroll is that the areas of high fishing were also the areas of high bird um, counts, for instance, uh, and wildlife activity. And of course, that was near a, a bank that was in the Gulf of Maine. And so those banks in the Gulf of Maine, water will run up against that and then run up to the surface. And anytime you get, anytime you can get deep water up to the surface, I think I called it upwelling before, you're gonna get nutrients that come up from that deep water. You're gonna put it into a situation where there's light and you put light and nutrients together, you're gonna grow pho uh, phytoplankton. And so that, that's the reason that those, bat, those banks like Browns and Platts and um, those types of banks are really, really important for fisheries, but they're also really, really important for, for birds. And so, um, and I see Will uh, has a, um, a link down there, but I, I think that session really imparted to me that oceanography at the end of the day is dictating where the forage base is. And then, you know, that basically, and in that case, that helped them cite it uh, a little bit further to the east of the bank habitats, right? So I think there are what I'm going to call mesoscale sighting, you know, medium scale sighting that could really be informed by better information on, on wildlife. Awesome. Uh, another kind of high level question. What do you see on the horizon with this technology and what's really the most exciting thing to you? Gosh, uh, um, the, the video that I showed is the most exciting to me is what can we do with drone technology coupled to particle image velocimetry and machine learning for image processing. So could we track uh, the oceanography and bird movement at the same time using drone technology in a way that um, doesn't require, you know, eight years of post-processing. Um, so what is it that our artificial intelligence or machine learning can do to help us process large data streams faster so that we can get a sense of, of really at the end of the day, the, the holistic natures of the ecosystem, things that happen below the water and how they're affecting the, the birds and bats and, and insects that are above the water. Um, so really, really excited about um, that kind of uh, high level processing so that if we go out there and we take a lot of imagery and we t do a lot of, you know, for instance, drone flights or, or put out thermal um, tracking, how quickly can we process that information? Love that. That's fabulous. Um, going back to marine mammals, just for a few minutes, um, a couple questions about right whales. Of course, we are talking about these whales all the time and what we need to do to protect them and interactions with right whales and how we make sure we're doing things in a very thoughtful way in terms of conservation. But what are those conversations looking like on the offshore wind side? And um, yeah, can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, so North Atlantic right whale, uh, they are, you know, many of the folks on the line are probably familiar. <clears throat> they key in in a particular Calanus species called Calanus finmarchicus. It's a zooplankter uh, that they really like to eat. It's a boreal species, so it's a species that's used to pretty cold water, and they track its distribution. And so, one of the difficult parts of North Atlantic right whale protection and management recently has been that forage base moving and they are moving to different places. So it's more difficult to uh, simply protect particular areas um, or even have consistent policies that aren't dynamic and, and keyed into the response of those organisms. Um, and I, I think that offshore wind will be in a similar boat, which is to say it will have to A, minimize entanglement risk, minimize entanglement risk, minimize entanglement risk. So it's gonna have to do that. Um, I, you know, the other, re, the other interesting thing for our project is to measure underwater noise levels and, and see if, if indeed the, the noise savings that you get from these floating turbines is, is as big as we think it is. Um, so I think uh, verifying that is a, is a good idea too. But as long as we don't, as long as these projects don't end up increasing the entanglement risk, the, the exposure for North Atlantic right whale is probably pretty low. Excellent. That's great. Uh, one more quick question, which hopefully is pretty quick. Um, but what can this proposed research array show us and teach us about what we can we can't learn from Aquaventus and the turbine off Monhegan? And how will this research be used by any future proposed offshore wind projects in Maine and beyond? How is Maine being a leader here? <laughs> 
Yeah, it's a really good question. So in particular, the things that I think you can learn from an array that you can learn from a single turbine are, first of all, turbine to turbine interactions, um, since we only have one turbine out at, out at Monhegan, and that includes the interconnection between the turbines. Um, so, and you, you saw that there's a one mile, you know, uh, ostensibly a one mile distancing of the turbines that you saw out uh, at, you know, at the example research array picture that I showed. It doesn't necessarily have to be that um, array, but that brings up, at least for me, the big questions about fisheries, right? Can, um, can we fish in between these turbines? How much can we fish in between these turbines? What's the impact on mobile gear, like scallop dredging or ground fish trawls? Uh, versus fixed gear like you know potentially gill netting or or um, the American lobster fishery, um, so that's the I think that's the big one uh, is what do we understand about the interaction between the fisheries and the offshore wind development, um, but certainly the other thing that you learn from an avian side is that the one turbine isn't likely to cause a lot of displacement, but as you get more turbines, then then birds may have to move around those places, and so. Something like displacement, um, you know, where you, you, uh, essentially birds work their way around those uh, turbines is going to be more interesting out at the research array than it ever would be at Monhegan, which is one turbine. Excellent. I think that's a great place to wrap things up. And thank you, Dr. Brady, for really just, we had a lot of questions today, and there are a lot more that we couldn't get to, unfortunately. But thank you so much for taking the time to share your knowledge with us and answer our many questions. And thank you to all of you for joining us today. Like I said, you're going to get a follow-up email from me with some links on how to learn more and actually get involved if you'd like. Um, but taking a step back, uh, one lesson that we've all learned living through this global pandemic together is that it is so important to savor the moments that we do have together with our friends and families. So because of that, we've decided to take a few weeks off from hosting this Lunch and Learn series to spend some time enjoying Maine's short, sweet, and fleeting, uh, beautiful summer with the people we love in the place that we love so very much. So we'll be back on September 10th. But until then, I hope you all have a wonderful month. Enjoy the rest of this beautiful summer. I hope we get some more sunshine for all of us. Dr. Brady, thank you. This was wonderful. And thank you to all of you for joining us today. Have a good one. Thank you.